I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about NLRB v. Hearst Publications or National Labor Relations Board. This is a United States Supreme Court case from 1944 about judicial deference to administrative agencies or regulatory boards and what we call the substantial evidence test. I actually cover this case in two of the courses I teach, administrative law and statutory interpretation and regulation. It's a landmark decision. It's probably in every administrative law case book. So let's take a look at the case and see what happens. So the case here is really about a labor dispute between a newspaper publisher, Hearst, and a union that's representing basically street vendors who sold the newspapers on city streets, specifically Los Angeles. And the opinion is famous for the court's deference to agency fact-finding. That's our big takeaway from the case. And the case predates the Administrative Procedure Act or APA by a few years, but it's a precursor to the APA's substantial evidence test, which is the scope or standard of review that courts are supposed to use when agencies engage in formal adjudication or formal rulemaking. And in this case, the NLRB had undertaken formal adjudication to resolve this particular labor dispute. The opinion, even though this is before the APA, the court actually uses the phrase substantial evidence two or three times. The NLRB was using it at the time. And so arguably the APA kind of incorporated and codified the uh, standard of review from the laid out in this case or that the court adopts in this case. The newspaper vendors formed a union and they wanted to engage in collective bargaining with the publisher about salary and working conditions. And there was a statute that was pretty new at the time called the National Labor Relations Act or NLRA, and it required employers to accept collective bargaining as long as it follows certain rules. In other words, they can't just fire workers who unionize and go on strike uh, as, as long as the uh, union is operating under the act. Now, this is the publisher, uh, William Randolph Hearst. Uh, he's an early media mogul, one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in the world at the time. And he said, I'm not negotiating with the street vendors. He said that the newspaper vendors were not employees under the act. And this really matters because if they're not employees, the company can just fire them, or terminate them if they try to unionize or if they go on strike. By the way, you may have learned about William Randolph Hearst in a history class before law school. He's a, so he owned a lot of newspapers around the country in his day and is associated with something called, uh, historians call yellow journalism, or it's basically sensationalist incendiary news reporting that's designed to get readers fired up so that they'll buy more newspapers. His uh, ostentatious personal home was a small castle and Hearst Castle continues to be a tourist attraction in California. So let's move on. Hearst argued that the newspaper vendors were actually independent contractors, according to the traditional common law distinction between employees and contractors. So remember, at common law, we had some cases about the employment relationship, some in contract and some in torts that addressed vicarious liability uh, for, um, for employers. And the common law courts had some factors that they used and applying the common law would have meant that um, these particular street vendors were not employees, they were just independent contractors. But the NLRB disagreed. Uh, and as an aside, the vendors were called newsboys at the time, but the court notes in the opinion that they were in fact adult men who sold newspapers at newsstands and kiosks on sidewalks and street corners. And uh, why do we call them newsboys? Well, in the late 1800s, actual boys or children uh, were used to sell newspapers on street corners. And in the 1890s, there was a nationwide strike. These boys unionized. And this was part of what prompted the enactment of our modern child, child labor laws. And so by the time of this case, a few decades later, the, the 
the terminology had stuck. Uh, so they're still being called newsboys, even though these are adult men who are doing this as their full-time jobs. And the NLRB said that the statute did not import that common law definition of employee. And the, instead, the statute replaced the common law doctrines um, that defined the employment relationship. So the NLRB approach for determining whether workers counted as employees under the NLRA was to look at a host of factors. They would look at the purposes of the act and then the nature of the relationship between these specific workers and the firm. That's different than the common law definition. And I'm gonna explain this a little bit because this still comes up a lot today. So the NLRB in this case concluded that the newsboys were in fact employees, and here's the type of factors, and these would still be factors considered in this type of case today. They worked on a long-term basis. Again, this was sort of their permanent job. They had regular hours. In fact, the um, Hearst publisher sort of told them when they had to be open and when they had to close their newsstands, and they relied on their earnings to support themselves and their families. In addition, Hearst, the publisher, dictated the sale price. This means that on a slow news day when papers weren't selling, they couldn't uh, lower the price at the end of the day to clear out their uh, overstock, nor could they raise the price on a day when th there was a hot news item and the papers were selling like hotcakes. Uh, instead, they had to sell it for the price printed on the front of the newspaper. Uh, the publisher even fixed their ter territories and locations. In other words, if they found themselves on a place that had no, uh, it didn't have enough foot traffic to generate sales, they couldn't pick up and move to another street corner because that had probably been assigned to another newsboy by the publisher. The publisher controlled their supply of papers. In other words, they would go in the morning and pick up papers or have a big bundle dropped off, but the publisher got to decide how many papers they got at the beginning of each day, depending on how their sales had been going. The publisher, to some extent, supervised their work hours and gave them some sales equipment like these racks and booths um, that were really in the publisher's self-interest. They wanted to boost sales and display their papers. And so all of these were factors indicating that these were actually employees. The, the publisher controlled their activities while they were working. Now, we get to the court and the Supreme Court ultimately agrees with the board that the NLRA, the act did not incorporate or codify the common law definition, but the court does its own statutory interpretation to get there. And so don't get confused in this case, the court is essentially doing de novo review when it comes to the, the question of law about how to interpret the statute. They just happen to end up agreeing with the board about what the act means. And then once they decide that, it sets up the next question about whether this particular uh, decision by the NLRB is a question of law or fact. And perhaps the most important and difficult feature of the Hearst case is this distinction that the decision draws between pure questions of law and mixed questions of law and fact. Let me give a quick example. A pure question of law would be something like, uh, was a statute actually passed? Um, is it constitutional? A jurisdictional question. Um, the what the words of a statute mean. A pure question of fact might be something that you would find in the almanac, like what time was the sunrise yesterday? Or what day of the week is October 15th? Or something like that, that there's, it's really just a fact out there in the world. But the problem is when we talk about are these workers should they count legally as employees? That's a little bit of both. That's a mixed question of law and fact. And on that point, the, the big holding of the case, sort of the surprise, was the court decided to defer to the agency, even though there's a legal aspect of this factual determination, because there's a factual component of a mixed question of law and fact, the agency receives deference under Hearst. So let's go back. So the court treats this as a mixed question of law and fact and defers to the board's judgment on this point due to its expertise with labor relations and its familiarity with a variety of employment relationships. 
I pulled out a quote for you from the sort of substantial evidence part of the case that's the, um, I, I think is the crux of this opinion or decision. In making the agency's determinations as to the facts in these matters conclusive, if supported by evidence, Congress entrusted it primarily to it, sorry, primarily the decision whether the evidence establishes the material facts. So notice this is convoluted language, but the court is basically saying Congress has entrusted this decision primarily to the agency. And so we should defer to it as long as it's supported by some evidence in the record. Hence, it goes on, in reviewing the board's ultimate conclusions, it is not the court's function to substitute its own inferences of fact for the board's when the latter have support in the record. I'm going to make a crude analogy that I, um, is not a perfect one. This is a little bit like appellate courts deferring to the, a jury verdict, right, on a question of fact, as opposed to the legal questions in the case. It's not a perfect analogy, and we'll come back to that later. What this does mean, though, is that when the uh, an agency or a board conducts formal adjudication and makes some fact finding, considers evidence and testimony, it, it has a hearing and so forth. The court is not supposed to read the record and decide um, that the weight of the evidence favors one result or the other, as long as there's some evidence in the record supporting the agency's finding, uh, then it's supposed to defer to the agency. It's not supposed to make its own a fact determination uh, from reading the administrative record here. And uh, it, so please notice that the substantial evidence test is not the same as preponderance of evidence in civil trials. This is not a 51%. It's not, it's probably a lot less than a 50% uh, quantum of proof that we need in order to defer to the agency. Now, the agency can't make fact finding that there's no evidence for in the record, but as long as there's some evidence and it's substantial, whatever that means, the court should defer to the agency. So Hearst appears to establish a doctrinal scheme in which courts should decide pure legal questions de novo like on their own, but should defer to agencies on mixed questions of law and fact if there's substantial evidence for the agency's conclusion in the record. Now, again, remember, even though this case predated the Administrative Procedure Act, it set a precedent that courts can vary the level of deference to agencies depending on the type of question the agency decided. And so in administrative law, we talk about Chevron deference and Skidmore deference and our deference. And this is really kind of Hearst deference, although we usually call it substantial evidence. And it's this case is usually in administrative law casebooks in the section of the book about the substantial evidence test. And so in other words, this case sort of broke new ground even before the APA that we could have these different deference rules and different standards depending on the type of decision that the agency had made. This especially applies along the fact law distinction. Now, also please remember that instead of applying whatever the common law doctrine might have been for a, course, a case like this, the court focuses on the statute itself without reference to all the cases that had gone before the statute was enacted and the discretion that the statute gave, Congress gave in the statute to the agency. The definition of employee versus contract worker continues to be a recurring issue in employment law. And so uh, why, why does this matter? Well, even today, whether workers are employees versus vendors or outside contractors will determine their right to form a union and their right to strike without being fired, their right to various employment benefits like health insurance and disability insurance, unemployment, workers' comp, their pension, and so forth. It even affects their right to a minimum wage, right? So if they're employees, then minimum wage laws apply. If they're outside contractors, they might not, and overtime pay and so forth. And also, who's paying the taxes on their salary, their income tax and their social security taxes? Independent contractors have to pay that themselves, and employers withhold it from the salary and have to pay part of it 
Now, the fact versus law distinction may seem very clear in theory, and I gave some uh, clear-cut examples earlier, but in practice, it can really be confusing and debatable and may be applied differently when courts are reviewing agency adjudications versus when they review lower court verdicts. That's why I said it's an analogy, but it's not a perfect analogy to appellate deference to a jury verdict. It's not exactly the same analysis or standard, but it's the same. It, it is similar in that we are deferring. Okay, here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. When an agency conducts formal adjudication and then there's judicial review, should a court defer to the agency's findings of fact, assuming there is substantial evidence supporting the findings? Yes or no? Hopefully you know the answer to that. If you don't, you should probably rewatch this video. And that concludes our lecture about NLRB v. Hearst Publishers.